Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give a talk on the persecution of the Christian church across the globe. And I'm going to be talking specifically about recent events that happened in Nigeria, in southwest Nigeria. Now in the Christian church, we have something called Pentecost, which for us is one of our holy days where we celebrate the beginning of the church, where the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles of Lord Jesus Christ and the church went out to preach the good word and the gospel. Now this to us as Christians is an incredibly important holy day that we celebrate across the world. Now in the West, we're fortunate enough that for many of us we can pop into our church and we can celebrate days like that with no issue. We can go in there, we can celebrate Pentecost as I did last week and as many Christians in the past did last week. But in other areas of the world, such as Nigeria, such as the Middle East, such as Indonesia, there are persecutions that are put in place where Christians are identified and attacked specifically on those holy days. Whether it's Pentecost, whether it's Easter, whether it's our entire Holy Week of Easter, whether it's Christmas, regardless, Christians are identified and attacked. There are many people, many groups who want to see the downfall of Christians. And I'm not talking politically, I'm talking in terms of life and death. Christians in Nigeria, last week on Pentecost, last Sunday, in their church of St. Francis, as they were finishing Mass, armed men with AK-47s and improvised explosives came to that church. They identified the three exits of that church. They blew down the doors with explosives. They then had men stand on those other two exits. And as many people, of whom there were hundreds inside, if not more, as they exited, they were shot and killed. There was blood on the pews, on the pulpit, all over the church, on the statues, on the Bibles. It was a bloodbath. So much so that the media, those who did report it, mostly those in Nigeria and friendly to the Christian church, could not show the images. Why could they not show the images? Because they are so horrific that to do so would horrify many people and to, and to absolutely traumatize people. I want to make this clear. At this particular mass, at that St. Francis Church in Nigeria, there were women, there were men, and there were children, all of whom were killed by these extremists. Now, why do they pick these days to carry out these injustices? They do it because it is an attack on Christianity in particular. It is not coincidence that they pick Easter. It is not coincidence that they pick Pentecost. They wait for particular Christian days, the holy days of the Christian church, and they attack then. This is a specific and targeted attack on Christians across the world. We are fortunate enough in the West that we don't have instances like this. But our Christian brothers across the world have to constantly deal with persecution that is targeting towards them. It's said that on average there are 11 Christians who are killed every day across the world for their faith. Now, can you imagine such horrifying occurrences? We don't see it in the Western world, but our brothers and sisters elsewhere, we need to remind ourselves, what is the horror that the Christian brothers and sisters go through on a daily basis? We need to not close our eyes and pretend that everything is fine because everything is not fine. We are constantly under attack. To give another example, Sri Lanka, not long ago, during the Holy Week of Easter, had an occasion where 253 Christians were massacred because of simultaneous attacks on churches and hotels where Christians were thought to have gathered. That's 253 people. Now we compare this to recent events. We look at what happened in America. We look at what happened in Texas, where 18 people were killed, children, in a high school. And that is a travesty, no doubt a travesty. But 50 people in Nigeria were just killed. Where, where do you hear about that in the media? You don't hear about it at all. Why? Because it is not politically expedient to talk about it. There is no reason for politicians in the West to talk about Christians dying en masse in, in nations outside of the Western world. And so we just don't know about it. How many of you knew about Nigeria last Pentecost, the 50 plus that died? That's an estimate, by the way. That's an estimate of how many were killed. Some people on the ground say it was closer to 100. Women, children and men. And those who were not killed, they were taken hostage. The priest was kidnapped. 
There were members of the congregation that were kidnapped. So not only do you have Christians that were killed and their blood spilt in the church, you now have a situation where those who weren't killed are now being held hostage. This, unfortunately, in places like Nigeria, in places like Sri Lanka, in places like the Middle East, in Palestine, is a frequent occurrence. I want to give you some statistics to demonstrate how bad this actually is. In the Middle East, in places like Palestine, only 1.5% of the population identify as Christian. In Palestine, if you look at places like Iraq, they used to have 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Now, only 120,000 or so identify as Christians in Iraq. That's a tenfold decrease. Why was there a tenfold decrease in the number of Christians in Iraq? That's uh, from 2003 to now. Christians have just been absolutely eradicated in places in the Middle East. There is an outstanding persecution of the Christian faith in the places like the Middle East and in places like Nigeria. Christians need to wake up to this issue. I understand that many of you may not be identifying yourselves as Christian, but I promise you that this persecution that comes in Nigeria, it comes in the Middle East, that will eventually come to others who do not identify with the extremists and their demands. The Christians are targeted because they're the most vocal, because they're the people that are willing to make a stand against these extremists, and we have outward symbols of opposition. And that takes form in our churches, that takes form in our gatherings, that takes form when we celebrate Mass, when we do communion, when we do the sacraments, when we do any of these things. And that is an offence to these extremists, most of the time is Islamic extremists, that they will actively attack us. But I want you to understand that if they weren't attacking the Christians, they would be attacking the atheists. And the atheists and the Gnostics are the ones who are next on the agenda. The Christians are the ones standing up against this. And we do so in our way we behave, the way we conduct ourselves, and within the church. This is a call to all of you. Stand up for your brothers, either in faith or in humanity, who are standing against this extremism, and make a stand with them, and commit yourself to speaking against it. Become familiar with the oppression that Nigeria is undergoing, in South Nigeria in particular, by forms of extreme Islamic uh, fundamentalism, in Boko Haram, in the Islamic State West Africa Providence, which has been growing over the last few years. These groups specifically find and attack Christianity, because Christianity is the biggest threat to his extremism. Well, if you don't stand with the church, there will be no one left to stand with you if the church ever dies through this persecution. So take a stand. Say, I will not tolerate this. Talk about the Christians that are being massacred in places like Nigeria. The, the people who are being kidnapped from their churches off the streets who are being held captive by these groups. Speak vocally about it. These are the things that we can all do to counter these groups. How do you stand against extremism? The first step is to acknowledge it. We have problems across the world where Christianity is being attacked. It is Christophobic attacks in places like Nigeria, in places like the Middle East, in places like Palestine, in places like um, Afghanistan, in places like Bangladesh, in places like Pakistan. These are areas where Christians are constantly under attack. Think of your brothers, either in faith or in humanity in Afghanistan, who have had to go into hiding because the Taliban has forced them underground. These things are important because this church the church of the Christians, the radical church that makes a stand against this extremism is under attack. And if that church fails, then the rest of humanity will fail with it. The only viable defense is the Christian church. Nothing else will be able to make a stand. Nothing else will have that same influence, that same impact. Christians are willing, and you can see it at the park. Christians come to the park to debate. Thank you, brother. They come here to speak about their faith passionately in the, in the attack of overwhelming numbers of others who would do well to, do, uh, to attack Christianity. But they come here anyway. Why? Because Christians are the only group that can have a viable chance at dealing with extremism. No other group will. So I applaud you all to think about the victims of Nigeria, the victims who have been killed at St. Francis, the victims, the brothers in the Christian faith who have been killed, their blood has been spilt in the pews and the, the, the pulpit and to make a stand for them. Are there any questions before I move on to the next topic? So ladies and gentlemen, 
You have just heard about the plight of persecuted Christians. And I want to talk to you about what we can do to respond. I want to build on the, the talk that you've just heard. And I'm going to give you real practical things that you can do to stand up for the persecuted church. The first thing that you can do if you are a Christian is not fall into the trap of thinking that the only thing that you can do is pray. That's the problem with the Christian church, is that we face a problem and our instinct is simply to offer, up it, offer it up in prayer and do nothing more. There is something else that you should do as much as praying, and that is talk about the persecuted church. Talk to your friends about the persecuted church. Talk to your work colleagues about the persecuted church. Talk to your enemies about the persecuted church. Talk to your family about the persecuted church. One of the reasons why this is not a bigger issue is because not enough of us are talking about the plight of Christians. The second thing as Christians that we can do to help the persecuted church is obviously support those organizations that are helping persecuted Christians, such as Barnabas Front, Release International, Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors. But recognize that these groups are the equivalent of sticking a plaster on a stab wound whilst the victim is bleeding to death. We Christians must be much more radical in our ambition for the persecuted church. And that means, as Christians, we should be committed to the idea, to the idea, don't feed the trolls, ladies and gentlemen, don't feed the trolls, don't feed the trolls, don't feed the trolls. Don't feed the trolls. Don't feed the trolls. If you give him attention, he will just continue. Focus in on what I'm saying, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. If you look, focus in on what he's saying, he'll just continue, Cash. If you ignore him, he will go away. You're just Christians. What we must do is commit ourselves to the ambition of creating independent Christian states in regions of the world where Christians are being persecuted. An independent Christian state in the Middle East. A separation of Nigeria from North, from South. An autonomous state in India. A free Karen state in Burma. We Christians must have the ambition to establish independent Christian states in the Islamic world like we did in South Sudan, who broke away from the Sudanese. The next thing that we must do as Christians is to recognize that our great failing as Christians is that we don't organize above the level of the individual congregation. We organize at the individual level we organize at the group level within a congregation and we organize at the level of a congregation but we don't organize as networks of congregations working together in common cause. That is our sociological weakness and we must address it. As Christians, we must accept that the legitimate use of force is part and parcel of the solution to the persecuted church. I want to be clear, I'm not talking about illegal use of force. I'm talking about legitimate use of force as sanctioned by state authorities or legally recognized bodies to defend Jesus persecuted Christians. Jesus. Those Christians need more than your prayers. Those Christians need more 
than platitudes. Those Christians who are being bombed in their churches, having their women kidnapped, require us to have a greater response to their persecution. And it is unrealistic to expect any solution to the persecuted church, not to include the legal sanctioned legitimate use of force of arms to defend them from their persecutors. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Can you give an example? Where was it born? An example of what, sorry? The violence, the state violence that what you would sanction. Yes, yes. So, I've been asked what is a, an example of the violence that I'm talking about. For 18 years in South Sudan, Muslim jihadis waged a war against my brothers and sisters, killing two million Christians, enslaving Christian women, and they are still enslaving black children today in the Sudan. The South Sudanese Christians raised up an army to fight against the jihadis of North Sudan. Not only did they defeat this jihadi movement, but they also won for themselves independence. Ladies and gentlemen, just come forward in front of the mad guy. Just come forward in front of the mad guy. Don't be shy, come forward. He's only trying to kidnap my crowd because no one will listen to him. So, we have examples of where it is happening. Karen Christians in Burma are one of the leading forces fighting the military junta of Burma. And they have been fighting them for over 50 years. We Christians should support such Christian movements as they fight to defend village, wife, child and family and church. Any other questions? So, just, just let someone else ask a question so I'll come how, back to you. How do you feel about uh, the Christians murdering uh, the Iraq I'll come back to you. To Any war? other question? Hello, hello. When the uh, Muslims... Do you have a question? You're here, here. When the Muslims okay, go on, Dust. Are, uh, when the Christians, the Christian West, is murdering Muslims in Iraq for their oil and persecuting and drone attacks, how is that helping the situation? That's not Christians defending. So allow me to reply. So the myth, ladies and gentlemen, that you immediately hear by the reactionary progressive by those that want to see Christians being a doormat is to point to an example that has nothing to do with the church. Iraq was to do with nationalistic forces. The American state, the British state, and their determination to seize the oil fields of Iraq. So One of the greatest peoples that suffered because of the Iraq war were the Christians of Iraq. And ladies and gentlemen, Christians pointing towards Muslims false Iraq examples does not delegitimize the struggle of persecuted argument. Christians in because Nigeria, in Sudan, in Syria, America, in Iraq, in Lebanon, Christians in Palestine, in Burma, in Indonesia, in Philippines, in North Muslims Korea. In Iraq. These Christians and require our help with a and we memory, should not allow ourselves to eye. be cowed or bullied into silence by false narratives who done by people like us. A man that when he stands in the corner can never draw a crowd of his own, so he always tries to steal the crowd of others. A man who is motivated by anti-Christian prejudice. Let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen, this man here supported 
the attempted murder of a Christian woman in this corner just months ago when she was attacked by a knife and he has since then tried to justify that knife attack. I've never Just be careful right. who you are listening Just to. Just to check a reality check there. Any other questions, I said ladies two and gentlemen? I said Hatun was attacked, that I asked the Christian community... Any other questions on the topic? I asked the Christian community to beg Hatun to stop drilling <laughs> holes to the Quran and abuse Chris, do you want to go again? Because Hatun is desperate to be a martyr. You I wrote a letter, it's online. Ladies and gentlemen, God forgets that. You have a God choice. Has his own narrative. The choice is Will you allow to become a martyr? The continuation all I said was unchallenged. It? And all I said unchallenged the Christian community of the mass murder of Christians around the world. Because hate Will you continue to do nothing whilst so Christians is are being bombed Bob and raped always and enslaved? Liar. And he cannot even And progressive militants to like this say it is a lie. I, helped I challenge you all now. Pick up your phone. And Google persecutor church and see who is lying. Those who call you to action, those who raise awareness of those who try to whitewash what is happening to persecuted Christians. Describe here as Christianity is hatred and hatred. Christians, not. God. Find your courage for the God persecuted church. By hatred. Organize yourselves does not above the level of the congregation that says so that you can stand together, understanding united in the name of Christ should be against the enemies of the church. I asked Hatun. I wrote a letter a month, two months before I had to Any other time. questions, ladies and gentlemen? And Christian signed a letter okay. asking Hatu not to drill holes in the... So, Quran. ladies and gentlemen, do you, do you condemn Hatu? Do you condemn Hatu's writing? Uh, drilling the holes in the, the tattoo boys, into the, uh, the, the Quran. We're talking about the persecuted church. Have you got a question do on the topic? You condemn I that, Bob the Destroyer. Your thoughts on that journalist that was murdered in Jerusalem by the Israeli soldiers? Sorry. Thank you very much. So, I was asked about my thoughts about the journalist murdered, martyred, I would say, in Palestine. I know, bro. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we Christians have fallen into a false dichotomy of thinking that we must either support Palestine or Israel. That is a lie. The teachings of the Apostle means that we Christians have only one side in the Palestine-Israel conflict, and that is the side of the church. It is not the side of Israel. It is not the side of Palestine. An Israeli soldier shot a Christian woman who was doing journalism. She is a martyr, murdered like so many other Palestinian Christians at the jackboot of Israel as it seeks to persecute Palestinians in the Middle East. And we Christians should not be shy in condemning Israel when its actions cause the church to suffer. However, let us be clear, Israel's harsh militancy to the Palestinians is because the Palestinian lands have been overtaken by terrorist networks hell-bent on the complete annihilation of the Jewish state. The Palestinian authorities also persecute Christians in Palestine, especially Hamas. And notice 
every example of Christians being persecuted, there is always the apologist ready to come forward and deny it. Which is why, Christians, you must rediscover a muscular Christian faith, not that limp-wristed nonsense you see on the BBC. You must have the courage, the conviction, the determination, the inner resolve, and the ability to stand up for your brothers and sisters against all of their persecutors. And that includes the jihadis and Islamist networks in Palestine, in the Gaza Strip, who regularly harass and persecute Christians in those lands. Christian Zionism is a lie. Christians that support Palestine without condemning the persecution done by those Palestinian authorities against Christians is also a lie. The body of Christ must stand as one because when one part of the body suffers, all of the body must respond. Any other questions? Yes. No, well, you can ask a question, sir. Yeah. I'll come back to I you. just came by suddenly. Um, when you said Korea Christians, what happened to them? The Sorry? The Korea Christians. So, ladies and gentlemen, the question of the Korean Christians is raised. North Korea, South. North Korea is one of the most hostile and intolerant places to the Christian church. Christians are regularly arrested and put into concentration camps in North Korea. But do you hear about it in the news? Why is the liberal media consistently silent about the persecution of Christians? Why? Because it does not suit the narrative to talk about the persecuted church. Why? Because it's easy to ignore the persecuted church because you Christians are not more vocal and forceful to drive this issue to the number one agenda. The Christians of North Korea are being persecuted and so we Christians should be active in seeking the destruction of the North Korean government. Just like we should be active in seeking the destruction of the Iranian government, of the Burmese junta, of the Saudi Arabian government, and of any government that persecutes Christians. I'll come back to you. Anyone else got a question? I'll come back to you in a second. I'll come back to you in a second. I, I did, I, I did. No, no, do you have do you a question, sir? Go on. Why did the Americans what, what, what go there? What do you do here? Like, what's your message? What's, no, yeah, I don't I'm want to be to the, the question is about yeah, the persecuted wait, church. On go on. The I'm question on the persecuted church. I'm trying to get you on something. That's why. Right? Why are you trying to get you on something? In the he can film wherever he likes. Yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. He can film wherever he likes. Don't touch his camera. I'll stand right next to you. Why did the Americans go to Korea? Why? That's not about the persecuted church. Why did they go get? I want to know. Tell me why they went there in the first Why? Stop trying to act like a thug. You're not big enough. Explain that to me. You know, it's not on the persecuted church, bro. It's not. No, it's not. I tell you why. Maybe if the three of you work together. Yeah. You just brought that topic up. I don't know nothing, right? I don't know nothing. We're talking about the persecuted yeah, church, yeah, bro. I don't know nothing. Right? I'm here to learn you know, everyone's culture, right? But I, you said the persecutions of the Christians. Yes. Right? And my, my point to you is why did the Americans go down the 1950s? It wasn't to help the persecuted church, that's for sure. No, you're talking bollocks because you didn't mention... Which bit was bollocks? The bit you're talking about. Which bit was that? Did you know, the Muslims... Okay, I think we're done on the, the topic. Muslims, the Muslims... Yeah, I the think Muslims we're done on the topic. Went there in the 1950s. Chris, do you want to go again? 
Wait, wait. Yeah, he's not listening. The Muslims went there in the 1950s. It's got nothing with. with the what's that got to do with the persecuted church? The what's that right. got to do with the persecuted church? Bollocks, Ladies and gentlemen, you church? have to contend why for the narrative. You have to contend for the narrative. If you don't contend for the narrative and tell your own story, the enemies of the church will tell the story for you. So speak up for yourselves.